Between 1921 and 1929, the image conveyed by the United States was of a population living in the best possible society despite the prohibition and the rise of gangsterism. The industrial growth of the main economic power had never been so strong before, unashamed even. What a contrast with the previous decade marked by the Great War. The political and financial authorities drummed out the same message about confidence, durable prosperity, and well-being. Toward the end of the decade, the economic boom turned to general euphoria. The Roaring Twenties were also the days of the first Miss America elections, the first Oscar ceremonies, the first musicals, all set to a jazz background. To call the 1920s the period before the Depression, to call that the age of jazz, the age of prosperity, the Roaring Twenties, was to distort the picture. So it was not a, you might say, a boom in which everybody was enjoying prosperity. It was people at the top were, but most American, most Americans were not doing well at all. We hit a new stage of affluence. Suddenly, most American families owned an automobile. Only 10 years before, they didn't. They owned electric washing machines, electric refrigerators, electric uh, record players. The talkies, talk sound movies, started in 1927. So it looked like a new age. I think people were warning it couldn't last. But for the most part, America believed maybe there would be a little pullback, a slowdown, but we were in a new time, a new economy. The 1920s marks the beginning of the automobile moving to the center of American culture, and it meant that even working class people were eager to buy a car. Ça, c'est quelque chose d'impensable en Europe. En Europe, jamais un, un simple salarié n'avait une voiture dans les années 30. Il y avait que les patrons, des gens très très riches, etc. Donc, les États-Unis ont accès à une certaine frange de la consommation de masse, et ils ont effectivement commencé à développer le crédit. Credit becomes something that people can rely on. Credit for consumer purchasers, like buying a Model T Ford or buying a a car comes in as a phenomenon. In 1919, there were 6 million automobiles in the U.S. Ten years later, 27 million, one for every five Americans. Consumer culture uh, blossoms in America, installment credit uh, buying blossoms in America. It's the age of the flapper, of bootleg uh, gin, of jazz. It's also a period of enormous excitement about the stock market, uh, where all kinds of ordinary people, not just the stock market professionals who'd always participated in Wall Street, but ordinary folk began to see uh, Wall Street as a place to play, to grow rich quickly, uh, a place that was largely risk-free. Uh, and uh, therefore, the 20s in America is a period in which Wall Street, for the first time in its history, is associated with play culture, uh, with getting drunk, uh, with sexual abandon, uh, with consumer delights. Uh, Wall Street becomes a part of that larger way of life. America discovered a passion for stock exchange dabbling. In five years, stock market prices were multiplied by four. The Dow Jones index went from 100 to nearly 400. Such a rise seems incomprehensibly enormous in view of the actual economic situation. Dazzled and fascinated by the promise of easy money on the New York Stock Exchange, or Wall Street as it is known, Americans turned out their pockets. In 1929, $2 billion were invested on the stock market. More people than ever before were buying stocks. This was really the first time in American history that the stock market sort of moved to the center of the culture. The prosperity is so great and so widespread and so sustained going on for many years in a row that the average citizen who would never otherwise think of starting a business 
who would never otherwise think of getting into the stock market actually considers doing so. La bourse devenait le, le sujet de le sujet de, de, de tous les ménages. Tout le monde pensait que c'était un nouvel Eldorado et, et les ménages euh, investissaient leur, leur, leurs économies dans, dans la bourse comme un casino. People, particularly Americans, have always been trying to get rich fast. The difference is that in the 1920s, it seemed like there were more ways than ever before to try to do that, and the stock market was one of those ways. It was a new kind of wealth to people. You'd go in and you'd buy a stock, let's say, at 20, and you didn't know anything about the stock market. And the next day the stock is 23, and the next day it's 27. And you haven't lifted a finger. And boy, that was easy. If I just keep doing this, I'll make a lot of money and I won't have to do anything. And it got to the point where um, people became addicted to the market. The stock exchanges in Europe were aristocratic, that only a few people engaged in the stock exchange, whereas the stock exchanges in the United States were democratic. And they're ordinary people. They're salaried workers, they're middle class folks, they're shoeshine boys, they're housewives. They're ordinary folk like you and me. Uh, this is an extraordinary new phenomenon, and they are giddy about it. C'est une époque où les, cho les chauffeurs de maître conduisaient en ayant la tête légèrement penchée en arrière pour écouter leur, leur patron discuter de, 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 des nouvelles imminentes d'un rachat de telle entreprise par telle autre. Donc il y, y a une vraie euphorie collective. People would feel foolish not participating in the money that was almost there to pick off the ground. There was this kind of collective herding mentality. John Jacob Raskob, head of General Motors, assures everybody that the economy is safe, sound, and guaranteed to be prosperous. In fact, he writes a very famous article that appears in the Ladies' Home Journal. Everybody ought to be rich, he says in this article, and he tells them how. And this appears one year before the great crash of 1929. John Raskob wrote, if a person saved $15 a month and invested it in good common stocks, within one or two years, given the rapid growth of stock prices, he would have $80,000. The financial press hailed him as a visionary. It was like the gold rush on Wall Street. Millions of people wanted to be in on the action, wanted to buy stock, and there were all over the country there were offices with ticker tape bringing the results from Wall Street. There are ticker tapes in beauty parlors. There are ticker tapes on railroad trains. There are ticker tapes in bar rooms. There are ticker tapes on ocean liners. So that for the first time, speculating in the market becomes a kind of part of everyday life. It had never been that before. So you have brokerages uh, springing up in small towns, in villages, in small cities all across America, uh, you know, toggled together by electronic wire to the headquarters on Wall Street. Uh, encouraging people to uh, participate uh, in the street. It becomes a kind of sport that people are uh, all playing together. It wasn't the lower class that was buying stock, it was the middle class. Because one of the things that happens in the 1920s as part of this whole pattern of the new consumer culture is banks are more willing to loan, to make relatively small loans to individuals on no real collateral. That had never been done before. One American in three entrusted his savings to the magicians on Wall Street, especially as it wasn't even necessary to have the available capital. The stockbrokers gave credit. And the banks loaned cash and made their capital work. The brokers pocketed tidy commissions. And everybody made a fortune. People bought today to sell the next day. Investment companies multiplied and prospered. A new firm was set up every day. People speculate by borrowing the money on margin. That is, they put up a very small percentage of, of their own money to purchase a stock, maybe 10%, maybe 20%, uh, maybe even less than 10%. And credit is so available, and everybody is so super confident, overconfident, that these speculations will pay off in the end, that people are taking enormous uh, credit risks in investing in the market. As long as the price of the stock went up, 
your collateral in the loan was always covered and it looked like the easiest thing in the world and you get twice the bang for your buck. But once it starts to fall, the stock price starts to fall, then you have to put in more cash to cover the mar what's called the margin, the difference between the amount you borrowed and what the stock is now worth. Just around the corner. The new president of the United States, Herbert Hoover, based his whole campaign on one slogan, prosperity is just around the corner. They even turned it into a song. Like him, the best economists considered that the rise in the stock market was perfectly justified by the general stability of prices, the prosperity, and the favorable perspectives of the U.S. economy. He had a golden opportunity in his inaugurals to say, stock is too high, we need to do something about the market. But as a politician, if he does that, and the market then goes down, as it probably would and should, everybody would blame him for causing the crash. So he didn't do that. The election has again confirmed the determination of the American people, and opportunity must be given for the expression of popular will, and we should keep it so. When Hoover said that, the market took off again. During the summer of 1929, June, July, and August, when normally the market's slow because it's summer, people are on vacation and so forth, the market went crazy. Political and financial leaders celebrated this euphoria and this reckless speculation. This is everybody from President and Herbert Hoover uh, and includes the nation's chief bankers. And the country is so overcome by this sense of confidence. And they're being encouraged in this confidence by, by apparently the most uh, pr prudent, savvy uh, people in, in the country. The country's financial elite is saying everything's fine. There was no reason to think that anything else would happen. Uh, pe people really imagined that this would go on, and even the most famous economists. It drove stock prices up to irrational, even silly levels. Despite those crazy levels, as in all speculative booms, there were people who said the stock market is right. Those high levels are deserved. There is a Nobel Prize winner named Edward Prescott in the U.S. who argues that stock market was not especially high in 1929. The best experts, the risk experts, saying, don't worry, it will never happen. And besides, you can diversify. And if it goes down in one place, it'll only be in one place. Other places, it won't. That's absurd. In 1929, you had a stock market that had been going up, up, up. And as it kept going up, it sort of cut loose from its moorings, by which I mean, instead of being based on real values of the underlying companies, it was a speculator's market in which people bought and sold stock, thinking that if they bought it now, they could sell it later for more money. Investment pools were conspiracies, really, of insiders, uh, top investment bankers, sometimes politicians, who wanted to speculate in a particular stock. And so they would buy up huge amounts of that stock send its price, therefore, skyrocketing, then quickly and secretly dump the stock so that they could realize the profits, while all those ordinary folk who had been uh, encouraged to buy that same stock because they were watching its escalation were left with the losings. Ce processus-là, il y a un moment où il se déconnecte de l'économie réelle. Et évidemment, on pourrait dire, attention, c'est déconnecté, ça va péter. Oui, mais c'est de l'intérêt de personne de dire ça. C'est-à-dire que les gens continuent. Et les plus rationnels ici sont ceux qui se disent, je vais profiter de la montée des cours jusqu'à ce que ça s'inverse le plus tard possible, en quelque sorte. You can make more and more by taking bigger and bigger risks. Taking bigger and bigger risks led to higher and higher prices for stocks and willingness to borrow excessively in order to do that. And that created a structure that, once it cracked, came apart completely. Suppose stock prices quadruple and go from 100 to 400, even over the course of a decade. A lot of people would look at that and say, that is crazy. You would not trust a stock market that had prices going up like that. There were people who saw uh, that uh, the economy's growth was based on false premises and 
warned that a problem would, would arise. There are a handful of Wall Street bankers, investment bankers, who say that the economy and the market itself is way overextended, uh, that, uh, that speculation on margin is dangerous, that the stock market, the values on the stock market are grossly inflated, warning that, this is a, a, that there are danger signs. There are some people like the statistician Roger Babson, and they are systematically ignored. Roger Babson declared in September, one month before the collapse, sooner or later a crash is coming. It'll be terrific, colossal even. The stock market will fall by its own weight, and there'll be a mad rush beyond anything we've ever seen. The higher the market got, the more other people shouted down those who warned that the market was getting out of control. Because if people started taking them seriously, they'd start to sell their stock and the stock market would go down. There were signs before the market crashed that the economy was starting to go down again. Uh, Short-term signs of economic recession can never be trusted. We always have pauses and sometimes economies come back. But there were signs. There were signs of overspeculation all over the place, in particular the high level of stock prices, which were very hard to justify on any historical basis. But there was all kinds, there were investment trusts that average people were putting their money in. Investment trusts were able to borrow a lot of money to invest in stocks. Average people, typical people, were borrowing money on their own to buy individual stocks, margin borrowing. So there were all kinds of signs that there was trouble to come. It began to sort of vacillate through September. And then in October, it began to fall. And then in about the third week in October, the bottom started to fall out. And that's usually a sign when the bubble will burst. And it burst it did in uh, October of 1929. The crash of 1929 was like a perfect storm in which all of these improbable things came together at the wrong time in the wrong way. And on Thursday, October 24th, Black Thursday, collective insanity put in an appearance. In just a few hours, 13 million stocks were suddenly dumped on the market by panic-stricken shareholders who didn't even know at what price they'd sold their shares. After three years of intense speculation, Wall Street crashed. And no one was in a position to decide to close the stock market. The president of Wall Street was on vacation in Hawaii. The speculative bubble burst, causing financial panic. Through a domino effect, the whole of the stock market collapsed. The cumulative losses amounted to $30 billion, 10 times the US Federal Reserve budget, and more than the United States had spent during the whole of World War I. In six days, average prices went down 50% and kept falling. And what was even more unusual, the stock market crash carried on. Oh, the crash was inevitable. It was just a matter of time. It was inevitable. And then people realize that they had been assuming that prices would never fall, and that assumption was wrong. So their whole life had been based on an assumption that prices could go only one way. Of course, if they had read history, they would know that that was a stupid idea. They know that prices come up and prices come down. People had been putting their hand in the till at work, taking the money, putting it in the market, figuring that it's going to go up, so it'll go up. I'll cash in, put the money back in the till, and no one will be the wiser. But when the market crashed, there was no way to get the money back out. All of a sudden, they realized the model that had been in their mind was totally wrong. And realizing that they were wrong, they panic. But as they panic, what do they see? Their neighbor panic. 
on the market itself. Of course, the brokers are going crazy. They're tearing their hair out. They can't keep up with the descent of the market. Many people lose their money because the trades they tried to make couldn't be made in time at the prices they were trying to make them because the market was so over uh, it, the capacity to handle those trades wasn't there anymore. The wires are burning up. The ticker tape, which recorded all the sales, couldn't keep up, and it would fall several hours behind. And when it fell that far behind, that means that if you were at 2 o'clock and you only knew what the market was doing at 10.30, you were in big trouble because you didn't know what had happened. And as it was going down, those who were slower said, oh, I've made a mistake. I wish I'd been faster. And the process accelerates, and you get this sense of free fall. What precipitates that? I don't think to this day anybody really knows what precipitates Black Tuesday or Black Thursday, why that particular day. Cette vieille histoire-là, tout le monde savait que ça allait arriver, mais personne n'a prévu l'ampleur que ça allait prendre. There was that there was something fundamentally wrong with this economy, not only with the market, with the stock market, not only that stocks were grossly overvalued, but there, there were underlying problems with the economy, that this illusion of prosperity that had so captivated people for nearly a decade was indeed an illusion, and that the, the panic was a kind of inarticulate emotional recognition of that fact, because, in other words, it was grounded in something real. It wasn't pure hysteria. Inside, it's like a rail station at the start of the vacation, the Wall Street Journal wrote. A Niagara of liquidation. Men and women jostled each other to try to understand what was going on. These figures and letters were incomprehensible to a layman, but they spelled ruin. On the floor, there were thousands of discarded stock exchange orders, like empty cartridges on a battlefield, wrote the New York Times. The Great Crash is supposed to have produced mass suicides on Wall Street and elsewhere. Uh, it, w it became the object of a kind of a gallows humor. There were cartoons about Wall Street bankers jumping out of windows and so on. It's a grossly exaggerated legend. rumors were going around. Eleven speculators were said to have committed suicide. It is alleged that the manager of the Ritz required customers to pay for their room in advance, asking them if they wanted a room to spend the night or to jump. There were indeed some suicides, not very many. One of the most notable, however, was witnessed by Winston Churchill. Churchill was visiting New York at the time of the crash. He first visited the stock market and was struck by not the panic on the market floor, but by a kind of dazed somnambulism of brokers walking around almost as if they were in a kind of semi-comatose state. And then he went back to his hotel, and while he was in his hotel, someone indeed did jump out the window of the hotel he was staying with, who turned out to be a Wall Street broker who, who had been ruined. C'est l'archétype des histoires qu'on raconte quand un mythe se propage. Le premier soir où les cours vraiment se sont effondrés, les opérateurs sont sortis dans la rue. Une sorte d'angoisse collective, évidemment. Et, et puis alors, ils ont levé la tête là, à Wall Street et puis au sommet d'un des buildings, ils ont vu un type qui était en l'air. Et, et la foule s'est dit, il va sauter. Ce type, c'était un plombier. Il était en train de remettre une gouttière. Évidemment, il n'est pas tombé. Mais la foule attendait ça. Tout le monde a un petit peu envie de voir des spéculateurs se suicider. On en a envie. Ils s'en sont mis plein les poches. On peut quand même rêver qu'il y ait quelques suicides bien spectaculaires. On... On Black Thursday, Herbert Hoover refused to go to Wall Street, choosing to take tea with Marie Curie, who was visiting the White House. He reminded her that he had been Secretary of Commerce before being elected president, and that America was sure of herself and would enjoy endless prosperity. At the same moment, outside the deserted stock exchange, ruined businessmen tried to sell their luxury automobiles for next to nothing. 
the reaction, the official reaction to the crash of the market is, is a sense of shock, disbelief, and, a, and hubris, a sense that if they act and simply assure people that everything is all right, the market will immediately recover. John D. Rockefeller goes and buys some stock in a very public way to show that he too is confident that the economy is sound and the market is sound. John Rockefeller, the richest man in the world, saw his fortune melt by 80%. In the 93 years of my life, Depressions have come and gone. Prosperity has always returned and will again. It tries to assure everybody that the market is sound, uh, that this is a temporary lull, and this act of buying up stock is a, is, is a display of confidence in the market. And it doesn't work. Herbert Hoover, the president of the country, issues pronouncements that the underlying structure of the economy is sound, that people need not fear or panic but everybody does indeed panic. And the panic is irreversible. It's, it's, it's uh, extraordinary. It ha even has a sound to it. 10,000 people gather outside the New York Stock Exchange. The city is very afraid. They order a mounted police. They think there's going to be a storming of the Bastille that is a storming of the New York Stock Exchange. And that crowd gathers there and stays there for weeks. Uh, and is a kind of low hum that uh, kind of is emitted from the crowd, a kind of dull roar, a kind of, it's like the sound of panic, the sound of anxiety. very, very quickly, once the crash hits, uh, loses credibility in the eyes of the American people. He's doing nothing. He's making constant false assurances that always turn out to be untrue. did not recognize the crisis when it occurred. He tried to uh, say, it's not so bad, you know. We will recover quickly. His statements about prosperity being around the corner were an attempt to give confidence to the market. Uh, no president is going to say we're about to have a disaster. <laughs> but because they were false promises, when the reality showed them to be inconsistent with the, what they had said, it actually discredited Hoover. The Congress and the president together could have appeared on the Capitol steps easily and said, we realize that what we're doing is destructive. But they didn't. And the president did not look back on the crash apologize for having caused it and express any regret for its policies. It's continued its policies as it had before. He himself, I think, is so stunned by what has happened, so confident that the market will recover. The Federal Reserve was saying that the stock market crash was no great deal, no great concern, nothing to worry about, and that it was not presaging any kind of economic downturn. Well, of course, that was a dead wrong uh, assumption. The crash was not the event of one day. It really spread out across a week, and it's sort of the fall went on for almost three weeks from late October into middle November. After that, the market began to recover, and it actually gained back during the winter uh, something like a third of what it had lost. And it, was, it looked like recovery was on the way. Everybody was looking not at the market, but at the economy, what was going to happen. On a du mal à croire euh, qu'un événement déclencheur comme la baisse de la bourse, bon, qui perd tout de même euh, euh, presque 50% de sa valeur euh, en quelques mois, ça a déclenché une telle apocalypse. The crash on a particular day in 1929 was something like 24, 25%. But actually, from 1929 to the bottom of the stock market, the entire decline was 80%. A 
In fact, Wall Street had already started its long, interminable descent into hell. And the whole of America's economic activity followed this downward slope until it reached the depths of the abyss. It really snowballs after 1929. More and more banks fail. If you have money in a bank and the bank fails, you've lost it all. So that means there's a run on the bank. And there is literally a financial crisis. American opinion was shocked by the collapse of what was once the indestructible bastion of triumphant capitalism, the banks. People are desperate, and the banking system is collapsed. There's an enormous liquidity crunch. There's no credit available to restart the engines of the economy. One of the controversies of uh, 29 was what role did the central bank play? Would it have been able to reverse it, it if allowed, uh, provided more money to the banking system? The complete evaporation of confidence in the economy and in the financial sector particularly means there's no credit available. So it was a period of falling, you know, decline in economic activity that finally led to a financial crisis that then, of course, continued the downward spiral of the economy. Suddenly, a banking community will not be able to lend money. Uh, people will not be able to buy houses. That feeds on itself, and that's how recessions work. Businesses start to lay off workers. They can't get loans to meet their payroll. They can't get loans to keep their businesses going. Businesses go out of business. More people are let go. Other people are afraid they will go be let go. They stop spending. You spend less money. Business makes even less profit. More businesses go under. And all of this feeds on itself, and, and the economy sinks into this sort of death spiral, or at least a uh, coma spiral, let's call it. But uh, that takes time. Markets can collapse in a few days, but the economy sinking takes time. When the economy collapsed, there was no reservoir of consumer purchasing power to, 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 to buoy it up again. And people began to lose jobs. Then you get this shift. And once that mood shift starts, it's very, very hard to reverse again. And so you get this escalating crisis that begins as a banking crisis, but becomes a general uh, economic crisis. L'enchaînement qui se met en place, c'est inquiet par les fondements de la bourse, les ménages suspendent un certain nombre de d'achats, d'achats de, de, de biens durables, et notamment d'automobiles, qui euh, chutent brutalement en 1930. Les gens tout d'un coup perdent de confiance. Alors euh, la consommation, l'investissement, les stocks s'effondrent. Les gens arrêtent pendant un an purement et simplement d'acheter des automobiles. À ce moment-là, ce secteur doit licencier. Et les ouvriers de l'automobile qui sont licenciés, bah, à leur tour, cessent de consommer. Euh, en cessant de consommer, bah, ils propagent la crise à d'autres secteurs qui, à leur tour, licencient. Et en licenciant, on a un effondrement euh, de la demande solvable. Plus personne n'est plus en mesure de consommer quoi que ce soit. People stop buying things. They start worrying about the future, whereas before, the future looked like nothing but bright because the market was going up. They had money. But as soon as the market crashes and the underlying causes start to seep in, like the housing market. In the 29, l'immobilier va jouer un rôle très important. Dans, dans certaines villes, c'est 60% des ménages américains qui vont faire défaut sur leur, euh, sur leur emprunt. Quiconque est endetté au cours de cette époque ne peut plus payer, même s'il travaille. Tout d'un coup, les gens ne sont plus capables de supporter le poids de leur dette, font faillite, et du coup, euh, doivent à la fois arrêter de consommer et en même temps mettre en péril les établissements financiers qui sont intermédiaires, de leur, qui portent leur dette auprès des créanciers. And once the house prices stopped growing, the whole house of cards collapsed. Les ménages ont perdu euh, sur deux fronts. Euh, ils ont perdu parce que la valeur de l'immobilier s'est effondrée et puis parce que la bourse s'est effondrée. Donc cette chute générale des prix va se conjuguer à la chute générale de l'activité pour rendre difficile, pour mettre en insolvabilité tous les emprunteurs. As business failed, uh they couldn't repay the loans 
The only way they could do it by borrowing more and more. But that process had to come to an end. Et pour les ménages américains, ça signifie que tout d'un coup, ils se sont retrouvés pauvres. Mais c'est un choc psychologique absolument considérable. Les ménages américains qui pensaient qu'ils pouvaient se dispenser d'épargner pour préparer leur vieux jour, parce que la, la, la bourse silencieusement leur, leur préparait leur retraite, cette idée s'est effondrée. They thought that they had made their life, and then suddenly the floor dropped out from under them, and they started to lose it all again. I mean, who's hurt by a depression? The poor have always been poor. You know, this is not anything particularly new to them. It's a little harder. The rich, if you've got $20 million and you lose 10 or 12 million, you can still scrape by on that other 8 million. It's the middle class, the ones who are new to that lifestyle. And the middle class on that level, as I said, because of the consumer economy, was grounded in the possession of material things, whether it's an automobile, whether it's clothes, whether it's your house or whatever. And all of that is one by one taken away from them. And so the economy continues to descend and descend and descend, no matter what Hoover is prepared to do, and he's prepared to do not very much. Are the kinds of views that Hoover advocated uh, were the, the kinds of policies that made the Great Depression as bad as it was. He refused to really have uh, the kind of stimulus that the country needed. There was really uh, a lack of comprehension of the depth of the problem and the appropriate policies to respond to it. The results of the world war and its aftermath... To boost the confidence of the financial world, Hoover decided to urgently repatriate to the U.S. capital loan to Germany. This was a devastating measure and a monumental mistake. Germany, which was barely recovering from the war, was hit hard by the withdrawal of American capital. The effect was simply to cut the flows of money that had previously, in the middle of the 1920s, moved from, from the United States to, to Europe and had fed an economic boom. World War I was not forgotten in 1929. There was still a lot of anger that the Depression gave the Hoover administration and the Republicans at the time the opportunity to vent their anger, among other things. There is no way it would have saved the day by repatriating that money. Les propriétaires américains ont rapatrié leurs capitaux, ce qui a asséché euh, des banques, qui a asséché l'économie allemande, etc. Et donc il y a eu un jeu avec les capitaux américains très déstabilisateur. Donc autrement dit, c'est une strangulation progressive qui était programmée. I don't think they were fully aware of the implications of what they were doing. L'histoire du monde a basculé à ce moment-là. C'est pas parce que aux États-Unis on a connu pendant deux ou trois ans un taux de chômage à 25%. C'est pas ça. Ce qui fait qu'on reste traumatisé par la crise de, de 29, c'est parce qu'elle a traversé l'Atlantique et, et que la première, le premier pays européen qui est touché par la crise, c'est l'Allemagne. Et la raison pour laquelle l'Allemagne est la première touchée, c'est que la reconstruction allemande n'a pu être faite en Allemagne que par le financement de capitaux américains qui se sont immédiatement retirés au premier moment de la crise de 1929, retirant le tapis sous les, sous les pieds de, de, de l'Allemagne. The very first credit transfer spelled disaster for the German economy. The amount of the US loans was staggering. The Reichsbank had to send 14 billion marks to the U.S. in gold and currency. Investors were ruined. The emptied banks were mobbed. The international financial system and the way it worked clearly contributed to the spread of the crisis in Germany, and uh, that led to uh, contraction of the economy. So that was one of the factors that contributed to the uh, downward spiral. What had been a local aff affair, that is a largely American affair, becomes a European-wide depression in a continent which itself has been suffering almost for the whole decade from a very weak economy. Not like the United States. Europe hadn't been booming during the 20s, but in fact was suffering all the consequences of a devastating World War I, only was beginning to rebuild its industry and its agricultural economy and so on. Germany had been in an economic mess all through the 1920s. Remember the, the horrendous uh, mega inflation of the 1920s and just about wiped out the German middle class in the 1920s. 
And a lot of that was the spillover from the, uh, the horrible terms of the Versailles Treaty. Those debts, war reparation debts and war loan debts, hang over the economy, depressing it further until finally the, the depression spreads from the United States to Europe. Les capitaux américains. Ben, L'Allemagne en avait besoin parce que pour financer justement euh, les réparations dont une partie ont été payées, eh bien l'Allemagne s'est endettée. And when you look at the German the German deal that what Germany got vis-à-vis -vis France and what France did to Germany in that period and what the UK along with France did and what the US allowed to happen to Germany, we hurt Germany in a way that damaged stable democracy, of course. Et la France a tout fait pour favoriser l'extrême droite. On est parti de l'idée, puisque l'économie allemande va mal, c'est que c'est bénéficiaire pour la France. Et ça, c'était faux. Il y a eu en fait un processus dans lequel, à mon avis, les Français se sont révélés aveuglés par leur désir de revanche et il fait une erreur colossale. Évidemment, la crise est arrivée là-dessus. La crise n'a rien arrangé. C'est une république qui recommence à, à, à exister, à respirer. Et c'est 1929 qui a cassé cette dynamique, qui a immédiatement, bon, sur un corps fragilisé par les crises antérieures, rouvert la plaie. Alors pour moi, il n'y a, a pas de doute possible que c'est la crise de 1929 qui a, qui a provoqué cette montée aux extrêmes. Et la crise est venue frapper un corps malade, fatigué, qui n'a trouvé d'issue que dans le, le nazisme. En Allemagne, l'industrial production collapsed, les bankruptcies increased, et le nombre de unemployed reached over 6 millions, leading to widespread disillusionment and anger. Hunger marches were held in several cities and soup kitchens sprang up once again. We lived in the Mendelssohnstrasse, and I remember my grandmother distributing a sort of soup at the entry, and I asked what that is, it's for the chômeurs. It's the first time I've heard the word chômeurs. There's a parallel, but quite amazing, between the United States and the United States all along this period. In the two cases, the taux of chômage will rise to 25%, and we'll see the same exactement of the prices of the production, Qu'aux que, qu États-Unis, les pays européens vont, vont absorber la crise d'une manière qui va être plus ou moins tragique, mais, mais qui ne sera jamais aussi spectaculaire que ce qu'on observera aussi bien en Allemagne qu'aux États-Unis. In the United States, the shock wave of the stock exchange collapse had not subsided before the effects of the terrible, irreversible spiral of recession began to be felt. American industrial production dropped by half. Thousands of families had to rely on the soup kitchen for food. The economy did not recover, and by June, because spring was usually the big mo month for when the economy begins to perk up for the coming season, didn't happen. And as a result, the bottom just sort of fell out of the market again, and the country drifted along until about um, October. And it's not until really about October of 30 that the country begins to fall into a depression. America's sturdiest strongholds collapsed after the Wall Street crash. It was in stark contrast to the recent period of rapid growth. One worker in five was unemployed. The population seemed anesthetized. In New York, where every month 17,000 families were put on the streets, hundreds of thousands of unemployed, including many white-collar workers, struggled to survive, trudging through the cold for hours just to get a bowl of soup and a piece of bread. The government has no safety programs, no safety net, welfare programs. There is no unemployment insurance. So as people lose jobs and they're thrown on the streets, they have nowhere to go but to private charities. And those private charities are just completely overwhelmed. My early memories of the Depression was see, seeing my mother standing on one of these lines to get food, ashamed of being poor, ashamed of having to ask somebody for something. I remember that, you know, very vividly because it was very painful to see her on this line uh, waiting to get some food. As the Depression got worse, we moved from bad tenements to worse tenements. Of course, another thing I remember is my own family. My father was a waiter 
when the depression came, there was less work. And so my father had to do many other things. And desperately, he became a, a salesman of ties, <laughs> of neckties. Uh, because I remember I felt very ashamed. I walking past down the street to school, and there was my father selling ties on the street. And I, uh, to this day, I'm, I'm ashamed of my own reaction. <laughs> and another time, he became a window cleaner. And he did that until he fell from one of his window cleaning jobs and hurt himself. And I remember my father doing some cleaning streets or something like that. And that's part of the awful tragedy of the Depression. Um, it's, it's literally etched on the faces of people. Men get up and they go out to look for work and they know they're not going to find anything. And so they're going to spend half the day sitting on a park bench feeling useless. It was a reality that it was very difficult to escape from. I think you couldn't go anywhere without seeing the signs of depression. You couldn't go anywhere without seeing the boarded up stores, the factories that were not working, the people standing on the street. In the early phases of the depression, many men, for instance, still dressed up as if they were going to work because they didn't want to tell their families. They were too embarrassed to tell their families that they were unemployed, but then they would stand around in, in, in their work clothing. Um, all day in the streets to be away from home, to be somewhere else. Broken by the recession and prepared to do anything to survive, more and more people took part in numerous dance marathons, a 1930s variant of ancient circus games. The rule of these trials was simple. Couples had to dance for as long as possible, sometimes for several days, in the hope of winning the $500 awarded to the last couple standing, to the delight of the audiences who came to forget their own misery. The organizers thought of everything, doctors, beds, and food. The losers at least got the chance to eat. That's one of the things that I remember. Of course, another thing I remember is people being evicted from their tenements. Even as low as the rents were, they could not afford to pay them. And so the police would come, and they'd take their furniture and put them out on the street. And I remember as a little boy going by these scenes of furniture out on the streets and uh, you know, you might see the mother crying, weeping, you know, because they, it, it was not only that they had lost their home, but it was psychologically humiliating for them to have all of their possessions in full view of everybody and to, for everybody to know that they could not pay their rent. But once or twice I saw scenes of, of rebellion, people organizing to move the furniture back uh, to defy the police, and this happened several times. People, as they lost their homes, had to, had to go somewhere, and they went largely into these makeshift huts that they put together with cardboard and tin and leftover materials. They slept in caves in Central Park. There are tent cities all over America of homeless people that are called Hoovervilles in, 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 a, in mocking uh, disdain for what Hoover has visited upon the country. Central Park in New York City had a number of Hoovervilles, and Hoovervilles were, were 
for a number of years the shame of our society. Once I lived the life of a millionaire Spending my money, Lord, I didn't care I carried my friends out for a mighty good time Fine bootleg liquor, champagne and wine Then I begun to fall so low Didn't have no money and no place to go If I get my hands on a dollar again I'm gonna hold on to it till the grins because nobody knows you when you're down and down in your pockets not one penny and your friends you have not any but when you get on your feet again Everybody who wants to be your long lost friend It's mighty strange without a doubt If you're passionate about documentaries go online to view more programs read articles and join the discussion at sbs.com.au forward slash documentary